In this presentation, we will be uh, working on sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis is probably the most important thing we will be doing in uncertainty quantification. It is a really important learning exercise where we can learn what parameters are affecting uh, our predictions, what model parameters are sensitive to certain data responses such that they can be uh, informed by such data. There are uh, basically two types of sensitivity analysis. The first one we call local sensitivity analysis and the second one global sensitivity analysis. In local sensitivity analysis, we typically start from some base model make perturbation and uh, the global sensitivity analysis we actually do uh, Monte Carlo and that will be probably the most preferred sensitivity analysis when uh, dealing with complex systems and uncertainty quantification. Again, um, the book contains a chapter um, that talks just about sensitivity analysis. It's basically another data scientific methods, but we decided to, because of its importance in uncertainty quantification, we decided to, uh, to make it a separate chapter. So what can sensitivity analysis do for you? Uh, basically, its definition is that we study variation on input parameters, how they impact variation on responses of interest. So basically, we have three things here. We have some um, parameters on the input who that are uncertain. We have some box in the middle. Um, and out of that box comes a certain response given input parameters. So we'd like to understand um, how that output relates to that input. Because we're dealing with um, a complex system, many parameters, complicated responses, there's really no unique way to define sensitivity analysis. And so we'll have to look at several ways of to defining them and um, then figuring out what for what particular application would be the best. So what is the goal of sensitivity analysis? The first one, of course, is that we should identify high impact parameters. So if we have a model that makes predictions, then obviously only those model parameters that have impact on the predictions will be important. And therefore we can also reduce uncertainty on those parameters that are not important and simply by either fixing them to a certain value or reducing their ranges. At the same time, uh, parameters have uh, limited influence can then be um, somewhat uh, reduced in complexity and that will help us in our, in, in our computational problem as well by limiting the Monte Carlo, for example, to only those parameters that are impacting. What's going to be very important in uh, the kind of applications we're dealing with, and particularly in complex systems, is to understand the impact of the comb combination of imp uh, uh, parameters. So we've already seen in the, uh, the overview presentation that when we're dealing with uncertainty quantification uh, in its entirety, the holistic view, we have uncertainty in several uh, parts of the system. We have uncertainty in, in the geology, geophysics, or mechanics, uh, flow, etc., etc. So it may be tempting to investigate all these uncertainties separate, but what that ignores is that there is that it, that there's a potential interaction between several of these fields of investigation on on the responses and particularly the predictions we're trying to make. So quantifying these interactions are essential to understanding uh, these kind of um, uh, uh, interactions or sorry, these kind of variations that are existing in the responses. As I mentioned before, there are two types of sensitivity analysis. Um, either, uh, both of them are Im important, uh, so I'll cover uh, both of them. Um, the local sensitivity analysis can be seen more as a pre-screening, uh, simply because it can be done very, very fast. Uh, however, at the end, if we really want to understand the complexity of the system and how things are interacting, we'll have to perform a global sensitivity analysis. So in a local sensitivity analysis, we often start from some kind of base case uh, model and then make perturbations on that base case model. The problem, of course, with that, uh, as we'll see, is, is that this, uh, this is the definition of the base case model, of course, is somewhat subjective. So it often relies on uh, partial derivatives of responses because we're making perturbations from a base case. So that means we have get some local gradient that can be uh, calculated. In global sensitivity analysis, we're going to jointly vary all the parameters uh, in a Monte Carlo study. Uh, but that then will require, of course, many more evaluations in order to understand all the various interacting effects. Sensitivity analysis is used in many fields, uh, in science and engineering. And so it uh, behooves us to, to talk a little bit about um, what are the typical problems that we are dealing with. 
The first of all, of course, is that we are dealing with the so-called high dimensional problem is the problem that I discussed uh, in, in the, uh, the data science uh, for UQ presentation. The many uncertain input parameters um, themselves could be functions or maps. The responses themselves could be high dimensional, such as scalars, functions, or maps. Typically, when we're dealing with these black boxes, they are typically solving PDEs in numerical forms, uh, so we have to deal with large computation time. There's a non-linearity in the models. If the models were linear, then I think the sensitivity in the analysis would be quite simple, uh, and that's just not the case. And so, so this non-linearity is, is, is uh, hitting us in terms of the complexity of the problem we're trying to solve. Another very uh, important aspect of what we're doing is a spatial aspect of, of the problems that we have. We're not dealing with just a few univariate parameters. We're actually dealing with distributed, spatially distributed parameters. And so this spatial uncertainty, which is often modeled in geostatistics, uh, comes in as an important part uh, in uncertainty. And so, so what we'll do towards the end of the presentation is first to understand the impact of spatial uncertainty on sensitivity analysis, and then also the first simple way to actually quantify its effect. Again, to illustrate some of the context, I will use a very simplified version. Uh, I will use the, the DNAPL version and even a simplified version of this. So remember, this is a case um, where we try to use uh, water from rivers, pump it into an infiltration basin, purify it, and extract it in the well, but being worried about any contamination that may exist. So the responses could then be, what would be the breakthrough time of a contaminant? That would be a single response or what would be the concentration over time which would be in a function so in this case um, we'll look at a number of and i'm going to put my pointer on again um, a number of uncertainties remember uh, well this table is comes from the, the, the data science for uncertainty quantification uh, so i'll refer to, to that presentation but basically, if, if you have not even listened to that presentation, you can understand that there are num a number of uncertain parameters. In this case, we'll just start very simple and only look at univariate parameters, such as mean, hydraulic conductivity, variance, the, uh, the type of covariance. Actually, this would be a discrete parameter, so let's put that in the system, uh, range, etc. So what we'd like to understand is when we vary these parameters according to some prior distributions, what effect does that have on the arrival time of the contaminants? Or if we deal with a function, what does it effect on, on, the, on that concentration function over time? So let's start, first look at the local sensitivity analysis and, and the screening techniques, which are really uh, simple, simple approaches, very easy to understand, require a very few model evaluations, but we have to also discuss a little bit uh, the limitations of, of these methods. So there are two methods, there are many methods. I will only focus on uh, basically two methods, which is the one of the time analysis, OIT, or uh, the Morris method. Let's first discuss the one at a time analysis. It's a very uh, simple method, and I think many of you have sort of worked with this idea whether implicitly or explicitly. Basically, we start out build, building a base case model, and that would often resort to taking averages or the, the median of these various parameters. Once we have the median, we evaluate a response, we get a certain response, which in this case is, say, an arrival time around 24 four days. Then what we simply do is we change parameters, um, typically a certain fixed percentage of the parameter by uh, taking a parameter, changing the parameter on the negative side and changing the parameter on the positive side, which then leads to, by fixing all the other parameters. For example, I can change the k-mean. Uh, when I increase the k-mean, obviously I will increase uh, the arrival time. At the same time, I fix the other parameters. And I can do that for all these parameters and then create a nice uh, Pareto chart. So th the number of simulations are, are very limited. Uh, but also the, in the, the, um, the interpretation and the ability of this method is quite limited. Uh, first of all, it of course starts from assuming that the base case, which is the mean of the parameters, gives somehow the mean of the response, which is just not true in, in nonlinear systems, or not necessarily true. And secondly, we can deal with discrete parameters because we can't, uh, if you have a choice between A and B, there's no way of, of, of changing a percentage of that. And of course, the interactions cannot be uh, dealt with. So an extension of that uh, to get rid of the, uh, at least to get rid of the base case uh, issue is to start uh, 
making evaluations at many base cases, let's say. So the MERS method is a method that extends on the OIT design by evaluating what are called elementary effects. And so elementary effect is basically perturbing a parameter, keeping the other parameters fixed, and calculating a sort of derivative. And then redoing this uh, to avoid that dependency, redoing that for a number of these initial points. So essentially, I start initial point, make a perturbation, start initial point, make it a perturbation, etc., and thereby calculating many of these elementary effects. These elementary effects, I can then calculate the mean elementary effect, and I can calculate a variance of the elementary effect, and that would be these two equations here. So then I can rank uh, the mean uh, versus that variance, and then typically um, we cut up this region into, of course, low mean means negligible, and uh, low or high variance means that if there is a high variance, that, that possibly... Uh, they're also, uh, it's a normal mean effect or there are interactions, although I can't really distinguish that. So what we see in this particular case is that just like before in our previous analysis with OIT, indeed we see that we have a number of parameters uh, that are, um, that have no negligible, but then I have a parameter here k-mean which is important uh, and also it seems to have either an interaction or some nonlinear effect. Uh, to the problem and also uh, the, the gradient uh, in the system. This is a groundwater system, so the gradient is also an important parameter. So in summary, these screening te uh, techniques are, are quite useful, particularly the Morse method, uh, because it, it has a, a somewhat an independence of the base case. It can give rapidly some insight in what's really happening broadly in the system. Um, and possibly it, it's... Um, best used to identify parameters that pro probably can be removed from the study. If indeed um, we have parameters that have that very low mean and very low variance, there's a lot, probably a little chance that even in a global sensitivity analysis, uh, they will have any effect, although we have to at least uh, keep our eye, uh, eye out on that. Um, there are a number of um, disadvantages. Um, so we really can't quantify here interactions, uh, but we don't really know whether that high mean and high variance is either a nonlinear factor or an interaction. We are limited to single responses. We have to only deal with univariate input variables, and uh, we can't really deal with a spatial uncertainty. And so later in the presentation, I will talk actually about the effect that spatial uncertainty has on the, the trigenator charts uh, that are being presented by these methods. So that comes to the second part of this uh, presentation, which is global sensitivity analysis, is also where I spend uh, most of the time on. Um, again, look, global sensitivity is really closely linked with uncertainty quantification, simply because we'll be doing Monte Carlo on some prior distributions. So this Monte Carlo will be used for calculating sensitivity, but can later also be used for uh, doing Bayesian analysis and updating parameters. So you, you, you can do with that simple single Monte Carlo, a few Monte Carlo runs, you can already start doing a lot of things, not just uncertainty quantification, and it's not search sensitivity analysis. And so there are a number of uh, methods uh, that we'll talk about. First are the linear methods, uh, which are limited. The variance-based method is also called SOBOL. Uh, the regionalized sensitivity analysis methods and its extension to distance-based generalized sensitivity and the tree-based sensitivity analysis. So the simplest way, of course, is to look at, at Du Monte Carlo and then look at scatter plots between input parameters, which are shown here, and, and the output responses arrival time, and then simply look at the correlation coefficient. And so we notice here again that k-mean, the mean hydraulic connectivity, is an important parameter, uh, and some of the parameters have almost no uh, effect. Here now we are actually also uh, studying uh, a little bit, start to study a little bit, uh, a discrete parameter. So we have basically a choice between a Gaussian variogram and a spherical variogram for the hydraulic connectivity. But of course, you see again, the problem is that um, it's difficult to look at these scatter plots and say whether or not there's a, it seems to be somewhat of a sensitivity, but it's hard to determine that with a correlation coefficient. Additionally, of course, uh, we're not looking at uh, combined effects, um, although you could say making products will, will tell us something about that correlation coefficient, but that's something that we'll then uh, study more carefully when we're dealing with uh, regression. <clears throat> 
A, form, a more formal way of approaching that problem is to look at uh, linear regression analysis. So here we see a typical linear regression with um, um, a linear part and an, and an interacting part. So the first thing we would do is, as, as say, fit uh, the various um, beta coefficients. Let's focus first pro uh, only on the first part and not look at the interactions. So after fitting, what we typically calculate are the standard uh, regression coefficients. So this coefficient SRC are equivalent to performing uh, the regression analysis when uh, with the input and output variables normalized to a mean of zero and varies of one. So a large uh, SRD, which uh, SRC, uh, which you then see in this table here, would indicate a large change in the um, response of a unit change of the input parameters. So large SRC, the larger the SRC, the more important an input parameter is. However, if these input parameters are, are start to be dependent, and that's often the case in the kind of problems we're dealing with, then the SRC are not suitable for measuring importance. So the other thing that's important here in the linear regression is to, is to, to assess whether we, the, the model fits uh, well or not, because these SRC coefficients are basically calculated from uh, the model fit, they're not calculated from the data. To make that more formal, uh, because we're dealing with limited amount of, of information, uh, we can do a formal uh, student t-test uh, to test whether it is um, by, by hypothesis test basically whether the beta is there or not, uh, test whether they are inflammations or not, these parameters. Again, can deal with uh, discrete parameters and a spatial uncertainty. So here are some uh, results. Some uh, Pareto plots that show uh, the results of the student t-test. So this would be the t-statistic. The higher the t-statistics, um, the more um, um, influential the parameter is. So in this case, again, we see k-mean uh, being very important uh, and some other of the other parameters uh, unimportant. This is, however, without studying interaction. When we study interactions, then, of course, the whole story changes because we fit a different function, uh, the different regression model. And so when we look at interaction, we can plot both the interaction of k-mean and k-range. What that basically means is that it's the combination of um, a, a change in the mean and the, and the variogram range that has the highest effect, and not necessarily a change just in the k-mean or in the variogram range, which is over here. So the nice thing about this is now that we can start ranking both interactions, combined effects, uh, with main effects or single effects. And again, we can calculate a line of significance based on this hypothesis uh, testing. So that sort of finalizes the first part of our global sensitivity analysis method in terms of linear regression. So it does offer a lot of um, advantages. It's really simple to implement. People understand it. it's very easy, reasonably computational uh, demand. You can also use it with experimental design. And of course, we are um, dealing with these linear responses, um, and um, the, the responses have to be somewhat simple, meaning univariate. Brings us to the second uh, sensitive analysis, which is a variance-based sensitive analysis. So in this card, there's a lot of mathematics here, and we'll not be covering that. So some of that you'll find in publications, just to Google, uh, so ball, and there are many excellent overview uh, presentations um, um, and also the book by Sal Telly, if you Google that name, um, you'll find um, uh, an excellent text on that. So here we are going to quantify uh, sensitivity by means of a variance, so the variation of a response. That makes sense, uh, looking at the total variation of a response as it can be attributed to variations on the input parameter. So the, 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 con the definition here of sensitivity is actually a variance. And so in Sobol, we typically um, look at two, um, two things, which is the first order index. So we can look at contribution of a single parameter without looking at its interaction on response. So that's a bit a bit that main effect that we've been talking about. And so also we will talk uh, more about in the RSA, regional sensitivity analysis. And then we can also quantify the, to the total effect, which is now we're looking at the total contribution, including uh, any interactions a parameter here may have on, uh, with other parameters in terms of the variance of the response. Again, to calculate this, um, we'll have to calculate basically variance of conditional expectations. And so um, in order to calculate that, 
typically we need to do a lot of runs. And that's probably one of the most uh, important disadvantages of Sobol. So again, I'm not going to show any math. Um, I would, with the presentation, we're going to focus on applications and, and providing you with overviews uh, such that you can go and look at some of the details yourself. So let's look at a, a fairly more sophisticated case now. Um, this case is covered um, in the book as well, and we've talking about this in, in, in previous presentations uh, or in other presentations. So we are dealing here with a reservoir study where, as you notice, we have um, spatial uncertainty on several properties, particularly permeability, porosity, etc. But also uh, we have uncertainty on, um, on the fluid properties, such as um, um, relative permeability parameters, which are found here. Uh, there's some geological parameters which are found here, and there's also faults, as you notice, in the system. I'll put on my pointer, that'll make it easier. Uh, so here we had the, um, the um, fluid parameters. Here we had some geological parameters. Here even we could put in a, um, a numerical parameters, which is the maximum time, the time stepping, for example. Um, you also notice that we have faults in the system, so we have um, also transmissibility related to faults. So we're looking at you know, a sizable amount of, of parameters here. So in Sobol, as I mentioned, it's a, um, it's a statistical method for calculating variance. And so in order to calculate that variance, uh, we'll need a sufficient amount of forward model runs. And so actually you can calculate this number. Uh, and this number depends on the number of uncertainty parameters. For example, for 12,000, for 12 uncertainty parameters, we need 14,000 simulations. And this is a fairly substantial amount given that some of these multi-phase flow simulations or, or these, these numerical uh, simulations may take a substantial amount of time. So here we look at as a response, which is called the total field water production. So in these systems uh, of water injection, we um, of course we want to produce oil, but because we're injecting water and using water to drive oil towards producers, we'll also start to produce water at some at time. And that was a time varying response. So a time varying response is that this, this response, the total water field production, varies from zero to uh, to 7,000 uh, days. So here we see the subal sensitivity. So remember, this is the first order effect, and this is the total effect. And so we notice that um, the parameter uh, vary over time, the sensitivity, and that, for example, the oil-water contact, which is the, the contact between oil in the system that sits above the water in the system, seems to be a quite important parameter throughout. Uh, then we have other parameters whose sensitivity seems to increase uh, as we produce and the sensitivity of the oil water contact decreases. This is typically the case since um, as we produce more, you're going to get more information in the system. Uh, we'll see that we get to know the oil water contact better. Um, and so the, that bad effect of, of the oil water contact will be, um, will be changing. So I think the variance-based methods or the subal methods um, are quite an, um, uh, have quite a, a lot of advantage or make a lot of progress on the linear uh, regression-based in the sense that they can be defined for any type of response. So it doesn't have to be linear or monotonic. And so the sensitivity measure, because they are based in, in terms of variance, have a very nice intuitive and also quantitative meaning to them. Um, there is a number of advantages, although uh, if you look currently at what's being done, um, some of these advantages are probably a little outdated. Uh, a lot of people are working in Sobol on responses that are not univariate. Um, computational demanding is an issue. Remember, I, I mentioned that number of simulations uh, that need to be done uh, does have a, a significant size uh, to them, and so that's an issue. Uh, so a lot of people work on that issue as well by, for example, um, using surrogate models or typically, for example, Gaussian process regression or Kringing is used as a surrogate model. Since we're getting a lot of model evaluations, we can start building up a statistical uh, proxy that then can be used and, and reduces typically um, the number of uh, model ev evaluation by an order of magnitude. Okay, so now we come to the regionalized sensitivity analysis, and, and I'm only going to talk about uh, the distance-based sensitivity analysis there because it's basically based on the regionalized sensitivity analysis. So recall our basic problem is that we have a number of input parameters. Um, could be large, could be spatial. Uh, we build models, so it could be groundwater models, um, could be reservoir models, uh, geothermal systems, 
minerals, whatever you're building models. And on those bottles, you will be evaluating a response. Uh, could be many things. Um, so a flow model, great tonnage curve in minerals, whatever you're doing, you're going to evaluate some kind of response. And so in RSA, we'd like to do something very simple. And that's the following. Suppose that I take these, um, these responses and suppose they're, they're not necessarily scalars. So the first thing I will do with these responses is start to group them. For example, you could say, I have a bunch of high responses and a bunch of low responses, although it doesn't have to be necessarily that simple. Uh, basically creating two group uh, of responses, let's call it the red group of responses and the blue group of responses in a lower dimensional space. So here we see that the issue or, or the, the concepts of dimension reduction we covered in the data science for uncertainty quantification presentation become very, very important. Uh, so we take these uh, complex responses, we reduce their dimension, allows us to do some kind of grouping. So recall that each dot is a response, each response corresponds to the model, which corresponds to some set of parameters by which the model is generated. And so um, once we have done that, we can start, start evaluating the histogram of a particular parameter in this group and the histogram of the parameter in this group. And so it's logical to say that if we find that the histogram of this parameter in, in, in the red group is very different from the histogram of a parameter in the blue group, that that parameter has impact on the response. It, it separates the response into classes. So to visualize that, we can calculate for that parameter a CDF. And here we see the CDF of a parameter, for example, could be, I don't know what this is, uh, the, the uh, axis, it could be a log permeability. Um, and we notice that the log permeability in the red group is much higher than the log permeability in the blue group, which could be related to the high and low response that we see in this particular uh, case. So we call um, this now um, an influential parameter. So a measure of sensitivity would simply be by calculating the difference in response between a difference in the CDF uh, between what we call the CDF of the blue group. The black here is the total uh, histogram of that parameter and the red group. So basically the area between these curves is a measure of sensitivity because it also makes sense then if there is an area between those curves that's very small, then it's very likely that parameter has no impact. So you could say, yeah, that's nice, but I think in order to calculate that, um, that area in a meaningful statistical way, I need a sufficient amount of samples, and that's true. So in the method, which we're not gonna go again in the math and the details, is we're using a, a bootstrap method to figure out whether or not that, that area here is significantly different from zero. And so that, again, that significance, uh, the more significant that is, the more influential a parameter uh, becomes. So if we, if we apply that to the Denapel case, um, we now get um, a plot that plots that significance, basically indication of that area uh, versus the parameter. So we notice uh, here in this particular case, remember now we put in the covariance of the model as a, uh, as uh, the model, sorry, the type of covariance as an uncertain parameter, uh, and we calculate um, the uh, sensitivity. Interactions now become equally possible. For example, I could look at the interaction between various components simply by saying, what is the histogram of parameter H Rivgrad given uh, the standard deviation of permeability? So in the two groups, now what I do is I look at one group and I calculate the conditional distribution of river gradient with KSD and the conditional distribution in the other group and then compare these conditional distributions. So again, if they're significantly different, then I have an interacting effect. So what's nice is that uh, in doing so, we can make this kind of matrix where uh, we put on the diagonal, we put the main effect so that the, these are these parameters here. There's basically these values, for example, that 97.8 is put in this matrix over here. And, uh, and then we get off diagonal elements. So in the ideal situation, of course, what you'd like is that everything is red on the diagonal or you have a few red on the diagonal, few blue on the diagonal and nothing off diagonal. But as we notice is that we get a significant amount of off diagonal uh, sensitivities. For example, we notice that K range is not sensitive, but it has somewhat interaction with, uh, with the river gradient, a very sensitive parameter. So we have to worry about these interactions. These interactions um, 
tell us that maybe we should not necessarily exclude uh, k-range as an important parameter, but that we should look essentially at possibly informing, this may possibly inform us about what ranges we should uh, set k-range to such that its interaction uh, with that other parameter is not ignored. And so there are some aspects of that that we discuss uh, in the book and, and in the papers we wrote on how this can be used to reduce uncertainty on, on various parameters. Possibly we're a little biased uh, because we developed this method, but uh, there, I think there's a lot of uh, things to say about uh, DGSA. And, and I, I think one of the things, it's very, uh, it's very intuitive. Um, it makes a lot of sense to take responses, divide them into groups, and figure out what the difference in the histogram of parameters are within those groups. And also uh, this division issue uh, leads us to doing that for any type of response, because we can also, we can always classify responses into, into groups. Uh, we'd also have to use two groups. You can use many groups depending on what kind of responses that we have. Um, another great advantage we will show um, in a bit is this issue of spatial uncertainty and how that can be addressed within that, uh, within that uh, framework. So the measure of sensitivity is now no longer a variance, which, which was the case for Saval, but is a, um, it's a, um, uh, a, um, sorry, it's, <laughs> it's a measure of significance. And so that for, for some people, that's, uh, that's uh, very difficult to, to interpret. Okay, brings us to uh, yet another method, uh, which is um, getting quite popular. These are the classification and regression trees, uh, also called CART or CART uh, for short. So classification and regression trees um, are very simple, non-parametric ways of, of fitting models to data. Um, one of the really uh, simple ideas of regression trees is that instead of trying to come up with a function, such as a linear function or another function that fits the data, is that we'll use piecewise, uh, piecewise uh, functions, so step functions. We try to essentially, uh, let me put up my pointer, instead um, of coming up with a function uh, form, a functional form, we'll try to take uh, the region of variation, for example, if I have two parameters, input parameters x1 and x2, and we try to cut up that region into various zones, and in each zone, uh, we simply estimate the function by taking the average of the responses that we have calculated. That's the y values. We calculate the average of the y values in each region. And then what we have is a function that approximates uh, our complex variation. That function is clearly not linear. So the question then is, of course, is that how do you cut up that region? And here it comes sort of the contribution. Uh, of, of, so imagine uh, that we start out with, with no cutting up. So the first question we have to ask is, on which parameter do we make the, the cut and where do we make that cut? So that depends on a definition of how much a variable reduces uh, the reduction in the overall fit. So for example, if I would take on the first variable a cut at T1 and I calculate the, the reduction in fit uh, because initially I have a fit that's constant. It's, it's basically the average of the of all the observations in this plane. Now I basically I get I get two regions. I get two averages. So how much does that these two averages? When using those two averages, do I improve the fit to the data? And so we'll take the variable that has the highest um, that has the highest uh, degree decrease, and we take the threshold with the highest decrease. So that seems to be a little bit of an optimization problem. It's a combinatorial problem also because we can have many combinations. And so uh, we don't solve typically that full combinatorial problem. We have a couple of greedy algorithms that, that allow us to do that relatively fast. So to keep then track of all this cutting up into region, um, we make this tree. So the first uh, branch of the tree looks at cutting up indeed on variable x1. And we take a cut in two regions, which is this region here consisting of R1 and R2 and the other region uh, consisting of R3, 4, and 5. And we go in this branch and we do this, keep on doing this. So we're creating these various regions in this tree. So once we have a fit of the model, we also can calculate a measure of uh, what's called variable importance. Namely, re recall that I mentioned how we calculate the reduction in, in the uh, squared error fit. So if I take this cut here, I reduce by having these two averages I get a reduction in the, say, this, the least square error uh, fit to my data. And so the amount of reduction is an, is an indication of how sensitive the parameter is 
uh, to the response. If I get a large reduction, uh, that parameter is obviously very important. Imagine that, that I get everything equal to zero in the fit and everything fits perfectly uh, by cutting it up into region. And the only parameter that's important obviously is X1 and X2 has absolutely no impact on the fit. So I can keep track of all these um, contribution to reduction and cost functions. So you get a summing over that as you go down the tree. And from that, I calculate a variable importance. And that is shown over here. Uh, so this is the variable importance. And the variable importance now is no longer, this is not a main effect. This is the, uh, that's a, a bit like in Sobal, we're looking at the main effect and, and also the contributions in terms of all its interactions. Because obviously in the tree, I can look at all of the complicated interactions that are existing by looking, going up in the tree and looking at, I start with region four and so on and, and make my way upwards. So that, that um, accounts for all the various interactions that I have between the various variables. So the tree based have a lot going from them as well. Uh, again, we don't uh, have to deal necessarily with the response. Um, and in fact, we have extended uh, the tree based sensitive analysis also to tree based sensitive on, on functions. Um, and so that, that allows us to add additional flexibility in terms of what kind of response we're studying. Um, it also can deal with any type of input parameter. Uh, we can split on discrete parameters or, or, or scenario parameter or continuous uh, parameter and also can be applied in the presence of uncertainty, especially also we'll talk about in a little bit. The only issue with the trees is that uh, you can't have too many of these discrete parameters. Say, for example, if you generate, um, if you have a parameter that can have 20 or 30 classes, then we'll have to create dummy variables or indicator variables for each of those classes, and then we'll split basically on those indicator, those binary indicator variables. And that for large amounts of classes, this leads to a large amount of parameters that are being added to the system. And so that is, uh, that uh, makes it difficult for trees to work. Okay, one thing I didn't, uh, or I mentioned a few times I didn't really study is what's the impact of the spatial uncertainty in the model. So for now, the spatial uncertainty has basically been a nuisance parameter or a, uh, a noise parameter, right? I, I, I said, let's generate a number of input uh, parameters. These are typically the global parameters of the system. Let's gen then generate spatial models. For example, I pick one random seed, generate one spatial realization, and then I evaluate the response. So we never really quantify this impact of this random seed. So one thing we should never do, uh, and unfortunately I've seen many times, is put the seed in as a, in, as a sensitive parameter. The seed is basically a, a categorical parameter, so it, it's, its actual value has, has no, no, absolutely no information. So please do not calculate sensitivity based on random seeds. What we first look at here is to study the effect of spatial uncertainty uh, on on the sensitivities. For example, remember in the one uh, the time analysis, we need to create a base case. So imagine that now when I have spatial uncertainty, I specify my histogram of um, hydraulic conductivity, my variogram of hydraulic conductivity, the boundary conditions, and I generate with one random seed, generate one realization, and I can calculate the sensitivities, which are desensitivities. If I now take another spatial uh, realization, then um, I, create, I can again create uh, a calculate on sensitivity. So what we notice is that the sensitivities are very different. Uh, for example, we notice that river gradient becomes important while here it's less important. So the order uh, of these parameters is starting to change. And that's of course makes it very confusing is which is not the right one. Uh, and how to aggregate all, if I do that many, many times and I have question of aggregation over all these uh, sensitivities. So that again shows um, that we can have violently different uh, results in these sensitivities, depending on what spatial model realization I select. The same for the linear model. So um, I can have a really accurate um, a prediction of arrival time when I have um, no spatial uncertainty, but when I have a spatial uncertainty, uh, then my linear model is um, the prediction right by the linear model is much less accurate and so this may give me a false sense of, of confidence while in reality if we count for spatial uncertainty uh, we get this uh, decrease in these uh, sensitivities. So one way to account for that uh, is the way I mentioned in the presentation on um, data science for um, uncertainty quantification. 
And so um, I refer to that presentation um, and this slide is, is, is there. So one way uh, to account for spatial uncertainty, um, and it's just a very simple way, so uh, it, it's not really giving us a complete picture, is to account for it by ranking realization. So the, 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 the strategy is that by ranking realization, I turn realizations uh, essentially into uh, an integer value. It goes from one to say 500. Um, of course, in doing so, I do neglect the local spatial variations. I only look at the, globe, the total variation that I see in these realizations, because of course, spatial uncertainty is a very high dimensional uh, variable uh, or, or the spatial variation high dimensional variable. And so, so by doing this ranking, um, I'm simplifying the problem somewhat, although it's, it's a good first step. So in the, in the previous, um, in one of the previous presentations, I talked about how we can use um, uh, kernel methods and uh, self-organizing maps to take these realizations uh, and essentially rank them into a lower dimensional space and then assign to each realization uh, a, a particular integer. So then we can carry this integer forward into our analysis. So let's apply that to uh, a particular case, uh, the Danish groundwater case. And so in that case, uh, we're dealing with uh, a parameter called local model architecture. That's the, the spatial realization of the buried valleys. So we don't know exactly where those valleys are. And so we have to model their spatial uh, uncertainty. And that's done using multiple point geostatistics. And in addition to that, of course, I have other uh, parameters, but these are univariate parameters. For example, what is the hydraulic connectivity of certain units? And what are parameters related to how rivers attach to the groundwater system? So here we see a sensitivity analysis um, of um, a sensitivity analysis of the data, which was in the Danish case uh, the head data, and sensitivity analysis to some prediction, which is how much pollution will get into the system. And so now you notice that um, the model architecture now comes in as uh, a parameter in our Pareto charts. Uh, one thing we notice in this particular case, for example, which is interesting, is that the model architecture is not sensitive to the head data, but it is sensitive uh, to the industrial, or the industrial pollution is sensitive to the model architecture. And so this gives us a more complete view of the kind of sensitivities that we have uh, and how single value parameters and sensitivities uh, compare to sensitivities related to the spatial variation uh, of these uh, buried valleys. Okay, well, thank you for listening, and uh, it comes to the end of the presentation. Um, again, the idea of the presentation is, is not to go into uh, the detail of every method. Uh, those can be found uh, in either the book or in the literature, but to give you some overview of what's, uh, what's available. Um, and here we summarized a little bit uh, the, various, um, the various pros and cons that I mentioned before. Some of these are our own sort of interpretation of things. You may or may not agree with it, um, but I think they're quite fair a representation of, of, of what we see. And so when we're looking at making choices for methods of sensitivity, you have to you could look at this table and say, okay, what do I have? Um, if I have a model that's linear, has no interactions, no discrete parameters, then maybe, you know, one of these screening methods are fine. But if I have to deal with uh, interactions, discrete parameters, stochasticity, I maybe need, either I need to look at uh, DGSA, not DG, DSGA, and the tree-based uh, method. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of where to go and, and what to choose for the particular application. Uh, again, I want to say that uh, there's no single best method here. There's really only methods that are fitting certain applications. And also what's important is to understand once you have the results is, is how to interpret them. Uh, and because the interpretation of sensitivity between those various methods are somewhat different.